Have you ever wondered why Chinese are good at exams? Why we just know 81 divided by 9 is 9 and 7 times 8 is 56? And we know all the chemistry formulas by heart? Well, today in this video, we are going to the China's Imperial Examination Museum. In the past, it was also the test center. So in this video, I will travel back a thousand years to explain how the system evolved over the dynasties, how it ensured China's dominance in the history, thus helping you to understand why Chinese are good at exams. And in our next video, we will show you the most important exam in modern day China, the college entrance examination system, and how it helps to select students into the universities in China. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel Global. The Imperial Examination Museum is located here in Nanjing because in history this was the largest test center in China and people had to travel hundreds of kilometers to take the exam here. So now let's enter the Imperial Examination Museum in Nanjing and travel back 1400 years in history. So behind me is the exhibition about China's imperial examination system. The exact starting point of the imperial examination system is a topic of debate amongst historians, with various theories attributing it to the Han, Sui, or Tang dynasties. The traces of clergy could date back to Western Zhou, which is between 1045 and 771 BC, through a local recommendation and examination system to select governors. Between around 700 BC to 600 AD, a bottom-up recommendatory system and a top-down appointment, nine-rank system has been used. However, those old systems based on recommendation in the end led to Ultrasocrats' monopoly. To break that, perhaps the very first emperor exam was established by Emperor Yang of Sui, giving everyone an opportunity, including the poor. Then it was adapted by Tang Dynasty, further developed and expanded. Such a system was so unique at that time in the world and resulted into similar systems in the nearby Asian countries in the next centuries to come. In the next centuries, the Keju system went through several modifications and reforms. In Song Dynasty, the examination and grading process was further refined to maximize fairness and impartiality. For example, it introduced scribes and anonymity system for the first time, meaning after the exam papers were collected, it will be delivered to the examiner's office area. The office area is divided into inner and outer areas. Exam papers will first be sealed, transcribed in red font, and verified in the outer area before sending over for grading in the inner area. Another major change is adding the palace exam to test the highest ranked candidates by the emperor himself in order to make sure the exam was not rigged, which was often happening in the history. During Yuan Dynasty, which was founded by Kublai Khan, or Emperor Shizu of Yuan, it was the first time China was ruled by non-Han ethnicity. And because Han Chinese were always achieving better results in the exams, two different admission groups were founded, one for the Han Chinese and the other for Mongol ethnics and other minority ethnics. During Ming Dynasty, the emperor examination system was further developed and also had two separate admission groups based on the north and south of China. This was due to the incident in 1397 when all 52 candidates selected from the metropolitan exam were from southern China. The notorious Bakuwen eight-legged essay in English was also formed in Ming Dynasty and became the hallmark of the Chinese emperor examination system. The term eight-legged refers to the eight sections that the essay was required to have. This resulted in an essay form that was high in structure and pattern 
but often criticized for hindering original thought and creativity. By the middle of Qing Dynasty, the system reached its peak and far exceeded the previous dynasties, both in the completion of the system and in the number of candidates and social impact. However, by the late Qing Dynasty, the emperor examination system could not meet the needs of the modernization for practical talents, especially under the background of industrial revolution, colonial war, and increasing social conflicts in the late 19th century. The system has faced criticism for its limitations and inefficiencies. Critics argued that the system placed excessive emphasis on memorization, prioritized theoretical knowledge over practical skills, and perpetuated a bureaucratic elite that hindered social mobility and hindered the country's progress. In 1905, Emperor Guangxu issued an imperial decree to abolish the system. So the abolishment of Keju was a very significant historical moment in his Chinese history. It represented an important step towards educational and governance reforms in China. It also reflected a growing awareness of the need to modernize and adapt to global changes and paved the way for subsequent reforms in China's education system and governance system. It also had a profound impact on China's most important exam today, the college entrance examination. Now, you might still wonder what exactly the emperor exam was like. Imagine you are a student in the Qing dynasty. So behind me is the emperor examination process in the Qing dynasty. As you can see here behind me, there are four different exams. This is actually a simplified version of the process. From the most local exam until the final exam in front of the emperor. It can be done in two years, but in reality, it takes typically 30 years for most people to complete. Yet, of course, most of the schoolers will never be able to reach that level. In fact, at each level of the exam, the success rate is in the range of low single digits. For the provincial and metropolitan exams, the candidates need to travel to the test center located in the provincial capitals. And that's not like today that you can take a high-speed train to the big cities. In the past, poor students might need to walk for a month. So as you can see behind me, these are actually the exam cells for the people that are taking the exam. And they're quite small, in, especially if you consider that people will need to stay in here for nine days, six nights. Why six nights only? Because every three days is one exam section, and you can leave the exam center only after each section. Candidates will also need to carry all their belongings, such as stationery, food, and clothes with them, into their individual exam cells for those nine days. Now, as you can imagine, in the past, there are no electricity. So here are some lamps that use oil so that they can still write the exam in the evenings. As you can see, the process of the emperor exam is a long journey that requires perseverance, determination, and financial resources. But the rewards are definitely worth it. For example, Candidates who pass the provincial exam are called Juren. In the old days, passing the exam to become a Juren could greatly enhance a person's social standing and potentially bring prestige to their family. No matter they pass the next level of exam or not, they are qualified to serve in government rules. Hence, you could see that usually plague were prepared for the families of Juren as a symbol of identity. And because of that, many people try to cheat in the exams. Behind me are some of the most famous fraud cases um, in the history. Like travel to a different province to take the exam, smuggle notes into the exam center, 
or simply bribe the examiners. In order to prevent this, the emperor exam had a strict entry check, including checking people's accent, requiring guarantees from others, and even cutting through food to make sure nothing is smuggled into the exam center. So behind me are some remaining um, examination centers. If you look at the tower behind me, this tower looks pretty nice, but it was actually used uh, to monitor the students that are taking the exams. So we talked a lot about the history of the civil exam within China's emperor examination system, which mainly tests knowledge in literature and Confucian classics. But actually, in parallel, there was a military exam since the Tang Dynasty for over 1,200 years in order to select military talents. But few famous governors in China's history came through the military exam. This also shows how important Han Chinese considers knowledge rather than force. And it has even influenced the other ethnic groups when they were ruling China, such as Yuan and Qing Dynasty. So China's emperor examination system in the past or in the ancient history was quite effective. It was a fair way to select um, talented people and also in a way you have to be persistent, you have to work hard, you have to learn a lot of things in order to be in this position. Um, however, at a certain stage it became absolute. Um, the things that they were testing were not really effective in the uh, near modern society. Especially the lack of scientific subjects like physics and chemistry. Nevertheless, the long history of emperor examination system has a profound impact on Chinese students, education and examination system nowadays. So in our next video, we will talk about the notorious college entrance examination in China today, also called Gaokao. So that's it for our video today. If you have any comments, questions, or topics that you would like to see in our next videos, feel free to comment in the section below. If you enjoyed our video today and our channel, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share so that more people can see our awesome videos in the future. Here, we inspire learning, exchange, and business. Thank you so much for watching, and see you in the next video.